We're delighted to welcome two uh, fantastic uh, Canadians uh, for a, a discussion and, and we're just delighted to be a part of it. Helen Branswell has spent the past 20 years reporting on infectious diseases and global health. She's currently with STAT, as Ed introduced earlier. And of course, Dr. Bonnie Henry, in her role as British Columbia's Provincial Health Officer, she's been providing the public across Canada with daily updates uh, throughout COVID-19 pandemic. She's an Associate Professor at UBC and the author of Soap, Water and Common Sense, a guide to protecting our health in a germ-filled world. I'd like to pass the platform over to Dr. Henry and Helen Branswell. Thanks very much. Um, so it's my great pleasure to have the chance to ask Bonnie Henry some questions today. I don't get to do that often enough. Um, and in fact, the last time Bonnie and I spoke was on January 23rd. I had been writing for several weeks at that point about this new virus that was emerging from China. And I thought I would do a story about how the people in Toronto were feeling, the people who had been through the SARS pandemic in 2003 there. So I reached out to Bonnie and a couple of other people and, and we, I, we spoke. And then two days later, Canada had its first case and I never ended up writing the story because events overtook it. And it feels like that was the way of the first half of this year. You know, I knew some of the things that were going to happen, but they all happened faster than I thought they would. There was local transmission in North America faster than I thought there would be. Places ran out of PPE faster than I thought that they would. It really seemed to be almost happening at warp speed. Bonnie, was that your feeling or were you anticipating that it was going to be the way it turned out to be? Oh, yeah, very good question, Helen, and thank you for asking that. I do want to start by just acknowledging that I'm talking to you today from the traditional territories of the Lekongan speaking people here in Victoria, and we want to recognize the traditional keepers of this land, or now the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And it's, uh, I think it's important for us all to remember where we came from. And talking about this reminds me as well. Yeah, I, I think I felt that way as well. My um, innate anxiety and in some ways post-traumatic stress from having gone through the SARS outbreak in Toronto had been um, had been kicked into full gear early in January, December 31st. I remember vividly um, the, the things we were hearing out of China at the time were, were exactly the same as what we had heard um, back in 2002 and 2003. You know, atypical pneumonia, small number of cases, no, no, nothing going on here, it's all okay. And uh, I remember uh, early in January um, pulling together the, the health system here in, in BC and saying, we need to start thinking about this because knowing our, our travel patterns between British Columbia and China, even even an, uh, you know something we'd never heard of, Hubei province, um, or Wuhan, uh, but we knew that there was a lot of uh, travel back and forth and we needed to be prepared. Um, but you're right, you know, we had our first cases here in, uh, in BC in January and it went really quickly after that. If you could wind the clock back, are there things that you would have done differently, you know, in those early days that you think might have had an impact on the response? You know, it, I've been thinking about this a lot. You know, after every crisis, we do have the recriminations and the class action lawsuits and the public <laughs> inquiry. Um, but uh, when I think back about early January, I mean, I've spent a lot of time, as, as you know, um, working on pandemic preparedness, whether it's here in Canada. Um, I work with the WHO on some of these issues. We, we, had, we had a meeting in Rome uh, last November where we were talking about public health measures and things we might put in place. And, and of course, mostly we think about it in terms of influenza, but I don't think we were really prepared for that mind shift that this was something that was going to move so quickly. And we were all watching China do what they did. And if I could have my time to 
opportunity to support China in a way that um, could have potentially uh, helped us contain this earlier on. Can I ask you to repeat that? It, it froze for me, and I, I don't know if it did for the reader or the other listeners. Okay, sorry, I will speak closer. If you could turn back time. Yeah. If I could turn back time, I, I you know, as a global community, I think uh, if we could have supported China in their response um, more effectively and, and perhaps contained it uh, more effectively at the source, um, rather than it became very polarized very quickly, uh, especially in some countries. And I know you're living in, in the United States right now, and that's one of the challenging areas where it became a... Uh, um, the sort of us against them mentality. And unfortunately, I think that allowed this virus to spread more quickly. Mm. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in the last few months about travel bans and closing borders and, you know, the fact that the WHO doesn't recommend them. In fact, the international health regulations uh, advise against closing borders. Is our thinking about that going to change with this pandemic, do you think? You know, I, I think earlier on, like when we think about SARS-1 um, and how it really was mostly confined to healthcare settings and very little community spread in different ways, and MERS was the same way. And then if we think about influenza, which spreads so rapidly because the incubation period is so short and it can have explosive outbreaks. And we know that travel uh, restrictions make no difference for influenza. And so that's the mindset we're coming from. But this virus now we know is transmitted through people and people travel and we do bring it in. And now it is a community spread virus where the incubation period though is long enough that we can actually stop people from transmitting to others if we can find them quick enough. So it, it is a little bit of a challenge because we know that it's spread through international travel, but once it's starting spreading in a community, then it, you know the, the importations are going to be a small proportion of it. Right, the other mm -hmm. thing that, you know, uh, you mentioned I'm living in the United States. I mean, the president here has made a big deal about the fact that he closed borders and he took this decisive action. But as he closed borders, Americans flocked home from Europe, from Asia, and seeded the outbreak here. I mean, this was this was something people brought home with them. Is there, in a world that is so interconnected, is there any real way to to use that kind of a measure to to keep yourself safe yeah it, well clearly we, we've shown in many places around the world that it doesn't that the closing borders doesn't help particularly because we got behind um, particularly with testing and i think in communities where we didn't recognize it was spreading we were at too much uh, virus in the community by the time it was recognized and i think northern italy you could say that um, many places in the United States, Washington State, very close to us, you know, we were sort of holding our own with small numbers of people traveling into to BC, but we had two super spreader events, one of which was a big uh, uh, medical conference, dental conference, actually, and the other was just a huge influx of, of people coming in from Washington State. And once you get to that point, um, the travel restrictions don't make a difference. So I asked you if there were things that you would have done differently. I think it's only fair to ask you if there are things that you think worked well in your response. Ooh, yeah, well, I think a lot of things worked well. One of the things that worked well, at least here in British Columbia and, and in Canada, was us coming together and having a common uh, place and a voice. So uh, the Council of Chief Medical Officers of Health, my counterparts across the country and the um, the Chief Public Health Officer for Canada. We started meeting pretty much daily in January. Um, and we, and I have to say here in BC as well, a meeting with the leadership of our health system to say, these are the things that can happen. And having lived through that experience of SARS in 2003 and then the influenza pandemic in 2009, we had a, a, Ebola in West Africa in 2014 that made us all take notice 
but to be able to pull ourselves together and organize ourselves. And we had the luxury of having some time because this virus spread other places first. So we could see what we needed to do. And I think, you know, relatively speaking, we did a fairly good job of that in Canada. I'm very envious when I see the numbers, I have to say. Um, um, are there things that your counterparts in other provinces, you know, put in place that you thought, oh, that's a really good idea. I'm going to snag that for British Columbia? You know, we all sort of got those ideas together um, when we talked about what are the things that we're going to do. And I've had the, 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 the task and the privilege, I guess, of, of chairing our Canadian Pandemic Influenza Planning Group for the last, it was supposed to be, a, I think it was a two-year time-limited thing, and I've been doing it for eight years now. <laughs> um, so the public health measures, the things that we could do were, were things that I was very familiar with and that we brought up regularly. So all of us, you know, we, we've been criticized more recently that people think they're getting different messages from um, public health leadership. But I think the basics we all agreed on early on, and we are all trying to learn together as we um, get more information about the, the things, uh, how this virus is spread, the, the use of masks, all of those things that, that science has caught up with as we've learned um, going through. How do we do testing? So, uh, you know, we, we have some natural experiments across the country in that uh, different people did different things slightly differently. Um, but it's very challenging because the other thing we have learned is that we are each facing our own pandemic and it is very it can vary quite a lot in local situations and you know ours was measured here in bc by um at first we had a lot of uh, impact on our long-term care homes um, then we started to see uh, people coming in temporary farm workers we started to see it in some of the essential working plants like food processing plants and our approach really was was driven by those types of events that happened early on for us. Yeah, I, I um, I'm as I'm in the states, I'm I, and as things in the states are so um, sort of overwhelming. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm not as up to date on what's been happening in Canada as I would otherwise. But I do know, for instance, that. Atlanta, Canada, where I believe you're from and where I spent a number of very happy years, uh, they created a bubble. And that has worked fairly effectively for them, has it not? Yeah, you know, this is something that is um, new to us. I don't think any of us had ever contemplated um, stopping interprovincial travel. Mm. But uh, the Atlantic provinces, my home province of Prince Edward Island, wouldn't let me come home. Not that I had time anyway, but... Um, you know, it's uh, it has worked, and we've seen it in other countries, you know, New Zealand, Australia, where you can effectively wall yourself off. It can make a difference in preventing that virus from having a tr the impact in your community. Um, I, I have mixed feelings about it because, uh, you know, I believe as Canadians, we, we are interconnected and we should be able to support each other across the country. But on the other hand, I know it has worked very well in um, in this where um, access to health services would be less than in a place like Toronto or here in British Columbia, some places in British Columbia. So there was a need to protect the population and to protect the health system, and it has been quite effective. Although we can see from what's happening in New Brunswick in the last few days where they started to have an outbreak that it's not perfect. And again, um, for this virus comes in people and we uh, we know that it is very stealthy now and we can inadvertently bring it and we spread it more commonly to the people we're closest with, the people that we love. Um, I should have mentioned off the top that I'm going to ask questions for a while, but we would also like you to ask questions. If you would like to submit questions, please do. And somebody is going to bring them to my attention and towards the end of the session i'm going to ask bonnie some of those questions um can we talk a bit about first nations communities you know um from the readings i've done about the spanish flu and and other outbreaks there's always huge concern about those communities being very vulnerable in pandemics certainly at the beginning of the h1n1 pandemic in 2009 there was a quite a bit of disease uh, in um First Nations communities in Manitoba and a lot of concerns around that. 
but you know, I was looking last night at numbers and um, Indigenous Services Canada is only reporting only 778 cases and 13 deaths as of October 8th. And I think in BC, First Nations people who've had COVID are about 1.6% uh, of your cases, even though uh, First Nations people make up about 4%, I believe, of the, the provincial population. It feels like something has gone right there. What can you tell me? Well, you're absolutely right. We have recognized um, through, uh, through the centuries that uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada have been differentially negatively affected by pandemics, whether it's influenza, tuberculosis, smallpox, um, the trauma of residential schools and colonialism has all contributed to um, First Nations communities and, and other Indigenous communities being um, more at risk. And I think really importantly here, um, well, across the country, the, the elders in communities are so much keepers of language and culture, and the need to protect that is so paramount. And I, I know Pamela used the term unprecedented a number of times, and I've had conversations with um, elders here in British Columbia and, and um, Pauline Waterfall, who's an, an elder from the Hetzik First Nation, said to me, you know, it's not unprecedented. For First Nations, it is precedented that we will suffer from pandemics. And it's what has led to um, the, the resiliency and the strength that we have as First Nations people. And, you know, I take her, her thoughts to heart. We have a First Nations Health Authority out here in British Columbia, and very early on, we have worked with them to make sure that we collect disaggregated data by indigeneity so that we can understand the impacts on First Nations communities. And we've been working to make sure that First Nations communities here in BC, and, and I know ISC is with other First Nations communities, to make sure that they have the data they need to support their community, that they can take the measures um, that we might not, in our Western way of thinking, um, feel are needed. Um, but they feel are the ones that are best able to protect their communities. And it has been very successful, although I will say in the last few um, weeks uh, to a month, we've started to see a, sur a resurgence um, and of cases across the country and increased numbers of, of communities, First Nations communities being affected. So we are working with them closely to, to look at how we can turn that and bend that to it back down as well. Um, can you tell me anything about how um, those communities have fared in terms of people being willing to take the measures that, you know, we know curb this, this, uh, the spread of this virus? Because, I mean, obviously, I mean, it's a huge surprise to me. I've written about influenza for years and the notion that people could wear cloth, cloth masks and actually curb spread is a shock to me. I mean, that you could bend a curve is, is a shock to me, but it, it works if people do it, but it's hard to get people to keep doing it. Are First Nations communities managing or how is it working there? Uh, you know, I think they have uh, here, and I can't speak for for all of them, but I know in my conversations with the First Nations Leadership Council here with um, chiefs and leaders from First Nations across the province, um, there's really a focus on what the community needs to do to protect themselves. And the communities here in British Columbia did that during the H1N1 pandemic in 2009, and they built on that resilience and knowledge. So there's a lot of things that they're doing that we may think from our way of uh, thinking is not warranted, but has been effective. Things like um, monitoring who are people who are coming in and out of the community, but also really important things, making sure if there is an introduction into the community that uh, housing is provided for people. Many nations uh, uh, communities have multi-generational crowded homes, and we've done things like uh, ensure they have, um, uh, not tents, uh, campers so that people can be moved into a, a camper if they needed to uh, self-isolate and provide them with food, provide them with what they need. 
and many of the remote communities, we've also pre-positioned some lab testing so that we can respond rapidly. So those are all the, the, the basics, but really it's about building trust and information and sharing with, with community. And, uh, and one of the really, really important things was talking with leaders early on about the, those important things in, that are needed around ceremony um, okay. and how ceremony is, is medicine in many communities and being able to have um, safe ways of celebrating people's lives and deaths and, and important anniversaries. And so that communication coming from First Nations leaders to, to their communities was very important. It kind of reminds me a little bit about uh, SARS in Toronto in 2003, you know, echoes, so many echoes. Um, so I have a lot of uh, relatives who live in British Columbia, so thank you for keeping them safe. Um, and, you know, in the spring, I, I was hearing so much about you and how things were going. And then there was that lovely piece in the New York Times. And um, I think you were everybody's favorite public health person. But I take it that isn't necessarily as true anymore, that you've had some problems, some death threats, and you've had to have security. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, as I'm sure you know, that has been a big problem in a lot of places. A lot of people who have been leaders and or public faces of um, pandemic the pandemic response have been getting uh, death threats to the point where some people have actually left their jobs in places in the United States. And I'm wondering, you know, are you worried that this backlash could discourage people from going into public health? It's not always the top priority when people are, are trying to figure, you know, people with medical degrees, for instance, are trying to figure out how to, how to uh, spend their careers. Does this worry you for the future? You know, it's some, it, it's been a, a challenge and a privilege to be the face and the voice of of the response here in British Columbia. And, and I will say 90% um, you know, of the messages I get are positive and people are doing the right thing. And we know that it's been very helpful to, to the, the communications is so, so important. Um, but some of the negative things happened very early on. And so it was actually uh -huh. in January that I, after the very first press briefing, I got my first death threats. <laughs> so, when people are in crises, they, there are many ways that people act out, and we've learned that. I've learned that through my um, involvement in many different outbreaks. And one of the ways is to, to, to lash out at me as the face or the voice of it. Um, and yes, it has meant that we've had to get cameras and security in my house, but it, I also think that it's, um, if we can help people, uh, get through this, if we can provide people with the information that they need. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important to put the data and the modeling out there. But if we give people the information that they need, they help, help them understand what it is we want them to do and give people the means to do it, most people will do the right thing. And that's the approach that we've had here in BC. And it has been effective because we thought it may take longer to get people's buy-in because it takes some time for them to understand things and to work through it. But I believe that if you do it that way, you have that longer lasting trust and, and um, commitment to the measures that we know work. And it can help um, in a way that if you start off with enforcement, it, it can sometimes get people to push back. So um, I sort of rambled a little bit off topic, but, but I do think the communications part is part of it. I mean, I hope, um, that there, there's been a number of strong public health leaders across Canada, a lot of them women, which is great. And I hope we're able to inspire young women to, to take on these roles and to be a strong public leader um, and know that most of it is very positive and supportive. And it, it is sadly um, in crises like these where there are some people who react um, with anger and anxiety and fear. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question and then get to the questions from the audience because they're coming in. Um, I, I, I heard a while back that, you know, some very big names in Canadian public health, uh, people who 
are more in the you know former category than current but uh people like david butler jones and greg taylor who were the two first uh, Chief Public Health Officers of Canada, Vivek Goel, who led Public Health Ontario, and Joel Kettner, who was on um, Manitoba's Chief Public Health Officer, had s written a letter to the Prime Minister and to the uh, Premiers arguing um, effectively that it, for something that sounds like what Sweden essentially uh, did, I think, sort of saying that the cost of, of shutting down was too great and uh, the approach that people should take would be to shelter the elderly and let other people live their lives. I'm not sure anybody's really managed to shelter the elderly per perfectly. So um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, has, was that helpful or how did you feel about that? You know, I, I, I think it is challenging. We recognize and we absolutely know that the things that we put in place, particularly closing down of in classroom schools, and a, a number of businesses were things, were blunt measures that had unintended negative consequences. There were also some unintended positive consequences that we're seeing. And, and one of the things we did, uh, I did very early on here was to establish a group to measure that. And we know particularly schools. So our focus has been um, finding that balance of living with this virus. I was. Uh, optimistic at one point that we could push it back into nature like we did with SARS-1, but you know that became apparent um, sometime around April that that wasn't going to happen. So we needed to learn how to live with this virus. And I would say that what we've done most places across the country, um, certainly here in BC, is very much what Sweden did, but without the high death toll, particularly in elderly people. And the way our society is structured, I think it's naive to think that we can shelter people, um, especially community dwelling owners. I think about my parents, you know. Um, it, it, there are many things that we can do to do our best to protect them, but we also have to, we all have to have a little bit of sacrifice. So we need to focus on keeping important things open like schools, like most workplaces. And right now we are not going back to where we were in March, where we didn't know a lot about how this virus was being transmitted. We were very concerned about overwhelming of our healthcare system, because when you do that, people suffer not just from COVID, but from everything else that they can't get care for. And sick people can't go into work and it affects the economy and business and the spin-off effects of that are dramatic. So we are in a very different place now. And we uh, are trying to find that balance. Okay, so here's a question from Danielle Goncharov, who asks, can you address how vaccine skepticism would be addressed or should be addressed? I mean, that's going to be a huge issue as vaccines become available, hopefully. It is. You know, and we're heading into influenza season and uh, we're um, encouraging everybody to get immunized this year as a way to try and protect our health system and keep us healthy um, when we're dealing with both of these. I, I think the most important thing uh, for a COVID vaccine is to be sure that we have those, um, those checks and balances in place to be able to show that Health Canada is doing the same things that they would do for any vaccine and that we are proven the safety and, uh, and effectiveness, but particularly safety being really important and and Pamela mentioned earlier that we are now looking at new processes where that type of safety data can be reviewed much more quickly, but it's still at the very same high standard. And then the other part we need to do in public health is make sure that we're targeting the right vaccines to the right people and that we have those programs in place to answer people's questions as we go along. And I think, you know, we can see that the, the vaccine candidates, we know there's the a whole bunch of them, a number of them in phase two, three trials together. Um, there, a couple of them have had to be stopped so that a, an adverse event can be investigated. To me, that is success. That's telling us that we are watching this very carefully and investigating any signal that there might be something concerning. And the other thing that we're doing in public health is making sure we have um, the monitoring systems in place that we can tell um, if any signals show up once people start to be immunized. So that's a, a very much a focus of what we're doing. 
Okay, so one last question here from Lila Ron Kanan. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Do you see gaps in our approach to reopening schools? School districts have taken varied approaches to mass social distancing, online learning, and it seems there is a gap or a risk in this approach. Is is a sort of mixed approach in order, or what do you think? Yeah, well, the way we've done it here, and I think my colleagues across the country is very similar, we set sort of the parameters, and then every school is slightly different. It depends on the age, the mix, the, uh, you know, the, the tight, how big the classrooms are, their ability to do remote learning. We know in the north, for example, that's very challenging, unfortunately. So. Um, I think it is actually very helpful that we have many different models of looking at this. And what we're trying to do is look at where we see exposure events, which we've had quite a few, and outbreaks, which we've had very, very few across the country. And I think that's important. We know this is in the community, so there will be some people in the schools, both teachers and staff and students, who may have the virus and bring it into the school system. But what we're not seeing is transmission happening and and uh, lots of cases showing up in outbreaks in schools. So that is reassuring. And we need to monitor every single exposure event to be able to understand if there's some things that work better than others. If you're in a classroom with no windows, does it make a big difference if you're sitting farther apart, or if you're wearing masks? So I think it's, it's one of those things that we have to learn as we go. I could ask you questions all afternoon, but I don't think <laughs> the schedule will allow. So I'm going to just say on behalf of everybody listening, thanks very much. Thank you, Helen. It was lovely to talk with you. Thanks so much to you, Helen, and to you, um, Bonnie. That was a fantastic discussion. And thank you for letting us uh, sit in.